In Romans 12 verses 9 to 21, Paul provides a vivid roadmap for Christian living. How do we express genuine love, practice hospitality, and respond to adversity? Join us for an insightful exploration of these verses, discovering practical principles for cultivating a Christ-centered and compassionate way of life in the world. Hello brothers and sisters, what a wonderful day it is to gather together and study the Word of God. I invite you all to join me on an expedition through the Bible. But before we begin our study, let us have a quick recap of what we learned in our previous discussion. First, we discussed some of the gifts of the Spirit. Though the list is not complete since God works in amazing ways through us, yet with the help of the Spirit, we need to find out gifts and utilize them in the right way that brings honor and glory to God. Secondly, we discussed our relationship with other believers. Paul listed out the conducts that a believer must uphold to be identified as genuine Christians through our actions. As believers, we must love others without dissimulation. We should bless our enemies and not curse them. We must speak out to get rid of any evil that exists within our church or community so that it does not lead to more corruption. When we serve God, we should be jealous in our duty and not laze around. We must show love and concern for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we must share in their joys and sorrows. In all that we do, we must do our duty as if we are serving God directly which is the focal point in Christian conduct. And finally, we discussed our relationship with unbelievers. Though God has forbidden us to be associated with them, He still wants us to live in peace with them. The unbelievers are watching our every move. Hence, any form of expression that we display to the outside world must commend us as faithful believers in Christ. Our actions must reflect the very nature of Christ. For to be identified in Him, we need to be like Him in every speech and action. We must do the right thing in all we do, and the Spirit of God who resides within us will perfect us. In the meantime, ponder upon your relationship with your government and neighbors. Are you on a good term with them? How are you commanding yourself before them as Christians? Are you turning your other cheek to them? Or are you repaying evil with evil? If you are having a hard time with this question, do not worry. Paul has more tips to help us practice our faith in the public domain. So without further delays, let's return to our study and listen to the advice of Paul. Welcome dear friends to another study of Romans with Through the Bible. Let's continue today as you listen to Paul as he speaks on how we relate to our neighbors and the government. So let's begin. Chapter 13 As we come to chapter 13, we still are talking about the service of the sons of God. We are going to see that the believer has citizenship in heaven, but he also is a citizen in the world down here, which gives him a twofold responsibility. If there is a conflict between the two, always our first responsibility is to our Lord in heaven. The Lord Jesus made it very clear that we have a responsibility to human government. You remember that he asked by his enemies, Is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or not? He asked them to show him a coin. He wanted to teach them from something they themselves had and also I don't think he had a coin in his pocket that day. He didn't have much which we have down here in this world. He asked them, whose superscription and whose image was on that coin. They said, Caesar's. Then he made this significant statement, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Luke 20.25 20, Governments are ordained of God, and he gave them certain authority. 
at the very beginning of human government he said who so sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of god made he man genesis 9:6 god has a regard for human life it is precious in his sight you have no right to take another human's life if you do you are to forfeit your own life our contemporary society feels differently about it and makes the criminal the hero and the honest man the villain we live in a day when evil is called good and good is called evil however believers have a responsibility to human government in fact paul said to a young preacher i exhort therefore that first of all supplications prayer intercession and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty for this is good and acceptable in the sight of god our savior 1 timothy 2 1-3 by the way we are to pray for those in authority not leave it to the preacher on sunday morning the duty of the believer as a citizen of heaven is spiritual the duty of a believer as a citizen under a government is secular these two are separate functions and to combine them is to fail to keep church and state separate and distinct the jew in paul's day was reluctant to bow before the proud roman state jury had fomented disturbances in the city of rome and as a result claudius had banished them on one occasion the proud pharisees rejected the roman authorities in palestine in their desire to restore the government to the nation of israel it was they who masterminded the encounter with jesus and raised the issue is it lawful to give tribute unto caesar or not the implications smacked of revolution as you can see it is well to remember that the authorities in paul's day were mad and murderous nero was on the throne of rome and there was pilate and herod all a bunch of rascals yet he said that believers were to obey those in authority now let's look at relationship to government romans 13:1 let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of god the powers that be are ordained of god we are to submit ourselves to governmental authorities for the very simple reason that they are ordained of god it is true that the kingdoms of the world belong to satan and that injustice and corruption abound in all governments yet god still has control History is the monotonous account of how a government flourished from a time in pomp and pride and then was brought to ruin and rubble. Why? Because corruption and lawlessness became rampant. As it did, God brought the government to an end. God still rules even over this earth. God has not abdicated his throne. He is riding triumphantly in his own chariot. Neither is he disturbed about what is happening on this earth. You will recall that when Uzziah, king of Judah, died, Isaiah was disturbed and very much discouraged. Uzziah had been a good king, and Isaiah thought the government would disintegrate after he was gone. So Isaiah went into the temple, which is a good place to go at a time like that. He came into God's presence, and he saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. In other words, God had not abdicated. Uzziah was dead, but God... was not dead god was still on the throne now the allegiance of the christian is to that throne and his relationship to his government on earth is submission romans 13:2 whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of god and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation in other words anyone resisting the authority is resisting the ordinance of god and those resisting shall receive for themselves judgment the principle stated in verse 1 raises many questions which the following verses amplify and explain this verse seems to preclude the possibility of a believer having any part in rebellion or revolution what about it james stifler cites the example of cromwell and washington both of those men led a revolution Stifla offers no solution. I am not sure I have one either, but I am going to do the best I can to solve this. 
The believer has opposed bad government and supported good government on the theory that good government is the one ordained of God. The believer is for law and order as over against lawlessness. He is for honesty and justice as over against corruption and rank injustice. At great moments of crisis in history, and that's where we are today, the believers have had difficult decisions to make. I want to briefly give you a viewpoint and I believe that it will coincide with history. During these last days, which I believe we are in right now, lawlessness abounds. The believer must oppose it. He must not be part of it, even when it is his own government. We need to beware of those who would change our government under the guise of improving it. Remember, John the Baptist was beheaded by Herod. Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. James, the brother of John, was slain with the sword of Herod. And Paul was put to death by Nero. Yet Paul says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Therefore, Christianity never became a movement to improve government, help society, or clean up the town. The gospel was the power of God unto salvation of the individual. Paul never went about telling about the deplorable conditions of Roman jails, and he knew them well from the inside. The conditions of the prisons are deplorable. Paul was kept many times in damp, dark prisons. Remember, he wrote to Timothy, Bring my cloak with you. See 2 Timothy 4.13. He was getting cold down there. It is very difficult to say that we are to obey a corrupt government. I am not impressed by these men, preacher or politician, who are running up a national flag and singing the national anthem as promotion for themselves. And behind it is corruption. Frankly, I feel resentful when I hear of certain government officials and certain wealthy men in position of power who pay no taxes at all. When all the common men are burdened with it. There is corruption in government from the top to the bottom and it is not confined to one party. These unsaved, godless men who are in positions of government actually do not understand God's law and therefore our governments are corrupt. We go about our cities and see fine buildings costing millions of rupees which we have built by contractors who are friends of politicians. Also, we see poverty-driven areas. While all the political parties talk about eliminating poverty, the poverty but remains. Oh, corruption is there. What's wrong? Well, the thing wrong is the human heart. What is the Christian to do? My business is to get out the word of God. And my business is to obey the law. That is what Paul is saying here. Christianity is not a movement to improve government or to help society clean up the town. It is to preach a gospel that is the power of God unto salvation, which will bring into existence individuals like the men who signed the Declaration of Independence and gave us a government of laws. My friend, nothing is wrong with our form of government. There is something wrong with the individual who are in positions of power. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. The government is to maintain law and order. When it does not do that, it has failed. I feel that a Christian should be opposed to the breakdown of law and order. We are to respect our rulers who are enforcing the law. I have great respect for our army, although it is honeycombed with corruption. I have great respect for the police officer, although I know they will make mistakes. Romans 13.5 Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Christians are to obey the law, not only because we will be judged and have to pay a fine if we don't, but obey for conscience sake. Romans 13.6 For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. 
Although we may resent the way our tax money is being used, we are to pay taxes anyway. In this verse, the word for minister is one from which we get our word liturgy. It is strictly religious and is the same word used of angels in Hebrews 1.14, where they are called ministering spirits. This means that the ruler occupies a divinely appointed office. He has no religious function, of course, but he holds a God-appointed office. That makes me pay my taxes. We need today a heaven-sent revival. One can be sick and tired of those who are shedding crocodile tears. They remind me of Lewis Carroll's brilliant satire, Alice in Wonderland. You remember that the walrus and the carpenter in this story were walking along the seashore, weeping because there was so much sand and not enough oysters. They kept on eating and eating and weeping and weeping. What a picture of corruption. But in all of this, the believer should submit to his government. Romans 13.7 Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Although they may be unworthy men in the office, we are to respect the office. If you are in the army, you have to salute the uniform. There are men in that uniform that you may not care about. But you yet salute the uniform. We are to show respect for authority. A Christian will be the best citizen, although his citizenship is in heaven. Now we are moving on to relationship to neighbors. Romans 13.8 Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Did you borrow your neighbor's kettle? Take it back to him. Housewife, did you borrow a cup of sugar from your neighbor? Return it, please. Oh, no one anything. In this we find Paul saying that the believer is positively to owe no man anything but love. This is a great principle to guide Christians in installment purchasing. You may ask, do you think we should turn in our credit cards? No, but you had better be able to see your way clear in order to pay your debts. The believer always owes the debt of love to his neighbor. That does not necessarily mean the man next door, but all people with whom you come in contact. This love is not some sentimental thing. It is quite disturbing to listen to liberalism continually talk about love, love and love. But the question is, how do you reveal love? Romans 13.9 For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now don't tell me that you love someone and are committing adultery with that one. You can call that love if you want to, but it is nothing in the world but sex. It is licentiousness, it is fornication, and it is sin in God's sight. God hasn't changed his mind about it. Thou shalt not kill. You can kill a person in more ways than pulling a trigger of a gun. You can destroy them by ruining their reputation. Thou shalt not steal. If you love, you won't get something dishonestly. Thou shalt not covet. When your neighbor drives up in a new automobile, how do you feel about it? Sometimes we say, I wish we had the car and they had one just like it. What we really mean is that we would rather have that car than see them have it. Paul is saying that our love for our neighbors is revealed in what we do rather than in what we say. He is not putting the Christian back under the law. He is saying that love manifests itself in not committing adultery, not killing, not stealing, not coveting. You can talk about love all you want, but if you commit these acts against your neighbor, you have no love for him. Romans 13.10 Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Loving your neighbor is the fullness of the law. This love, let me repeat, is the fruit of the Spirit. Let's close here, dear friends. God is love. And all who love Him and obey Him will know what love is. So may the Holy Spirit help you as you learn to love and submit 
even to the things we do not agree about. But let us adhere to God's will as He has spoken to us. God bless you. Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed today's study of Through the Bible. I hope that you finally understood your relationship with your neighbor and the government. The church and the government are to be separated. We have two duties to fulfill, the spiritual as citizens of heaven and the secular as citizens of this earth. Though God said that we should serve only one master, the government was ordained by God. And hence, we should show loyalty to the state, for God has the power over them, and their duty as the state is to govern us in the right way. Despite the world belonging to Satan and the corruption and injustice being rampant in all governments, we know that God is the ruler of all and has already defeated them. However, we must remember that the government is not the corrupted one, but the evil people behind it. The government was founded on the principles of justice and truth. And it is these principles that we should give our respect, not to the individual who wields power. For God holds the ultimate power, and no one on earth or in heaven has such power and might. Though it may be difficult to obey the law and order, when it is corrupted, as part of our duty here on earth, we must do it with all faithfulness as good Christians should. And as we come to a close, remember, loving your neighbor is the greatest commandment that God gives to us to conduct ourselves as image bearers of Christ. God showed His love to us by sacrificing His beloved Son, and Christ had compassion for everyone lost in the darkness when he visited earth. Likewise, we are to be like Christ and reflect him with our whole bodies. And then we are to extend this love to others as well. Love is the fulfillment of the law. And since it's a fruit of the Spirit, it will be reflected in us when we share this love with the world. In the meantime, how weak or strong is your faith? Are you judgmental based on the level of faith you possess in comparison to others? Do you look down on those who struggle in their faith? Or do you help them? Keep pondering and we will return with more spiritual nourishment in the next episode of Through the Bible. God bless you.